Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teo from the Continuing Church of God. I'd like to cover uh, some topics such as uh, abortion, uh, some stuff about its history, some things about the Bible. I'll also uh, cover a little bit of things associated with birth control. Sadly, abortion is practiced all around the world. It's done both in developing and uh, undeveloped countries. I'd like to give uh, kind of a definition of what they are, what abortion is. Uh, it's an operation and pregnancy, an operation or other intervention to end a pregnancy by removing an embryo or fetus from the womb. So that's an official definition I've gotten here. Now, partial birth abortion is an abortion that happens uh, at the later stages of pregnancy. It includes uh, uh, killing the baby, basically as it's being born, depending on how you look at it. Now, there's different types of techniques. I'd like to go a little bit into the history of abortion. So this is from Wikipedia. The first recorded evidence of induced abortion is from the Egyptian Ebers Papyrus in 1550 BCE. Many of the methods employed in early cultures were non-surgical. They tried things like physical strenuous labor, climbing, paddling, weightlifting, and diving. Uh, sometimes they tried uh, irritant leaves, fasting, bloodletting, pouring hot water in the abdomen, lying on a heated coconut shell. Uh, physical means included uh, battery hitting them, exercise, tightening a girdle, etc. Archaeological discoveries uh, indicate the early surgical attempts at this. However, they were not considered to be really common. Well, in modern times, uh, tend, they tend to use things such as surgery. Now, what they do is really pretty bad, pretty gross. So hopefully you can handle hearing this kind of thing. I want people to know the truth about abortion and basically, biblically, what the moral position should be on it and some other things here. Anyway, there's uh, at least seven ways abortions are done in modern times. First is a suction type abortion. This is where the unborn child is literally vacuumed from the mother's womb during the early stages of pregnancy. The second is called a curette type, where the child is cut from the mother's womb with a spoon like object. Third type is similar to cesarean operation. Baby surgically removed from the mother and allowed to suffocate because the lungs aren't developed, so if it's done earlier. Fourth type of abortion is a salt brine technique. The unborn child is literally pickled to death uh, by the injection of a strong salt solution. And a few days after the injection, the child is born dead. And then there's various partial birth abortions where uh, the baby is stabbed in the skull uh, or has its brain sucked out. And then there's also uh, an abortion pill, which they basically call a uh, morning after pill. Now, because it can uh, re remove a fertilized egg, uh, birth control devices known as IUDs, intrauterine devices, <clears throat> we consider those to be uh, abortion-inducing. And so we would not think those are acceptable to be used by Christians. <clears throat> uh, so basically... The, uh, in the U.S. government, however, they've made it so people, uh, women can get uh, an abortion pill uh, called the, the morning after pill. It's got another thing for it, and it basically kills the baby. As far as IUD, I was mentioning before that we consider that to be an abortive device. Women who use this, they'll expel uh, about one fertilized ovum per year. That's uh, what, what, what this says, presuming that they're sexually active. Now, Late-term abortions are basically done to try to make sure the baby dies. I've got a lot of information on it, and I'll simply say it's pretty gross, and I'm not going to go into it. But what I do want to go into is when does human life begin? Well, the Bible makes it clear that human life begins prior to birth. Since all fertilized eggs are human, human life begins at the time of conception. Interestingly, the word conception means to first come into existence. So even the definition of the word conception uh, supports the idea of when does life start. Now, what hap knowing what happens at conception might make this a little bit easier. Okay. Normally, unless someone's got a genetic disorder such as Down syndrome or something like that, uh, there are 23 unpaired chromosomes uh, from the 
egg and uh, 23 unpaired chromosomes uh, from the sperm. They come together and make a new entity that ends up having 46 chromosomes. And the new entity is a new human. It doesn't come into existence prior to conception, and uh, it doesn't change genetically really after conception. What I mean is it's, it's, it's not like a dog or a frog or simply a pile of tissue. The unborn baby is a developing human being. It took until about 2017 for the U.S. government to officially start to admit this. Okay, anyway. Now, as far as what do people believe in this, let me read an article. First, a headline. Scientists, that is. 95% of biologists say that life begins at conception. So let me read something from Matt Staver, founder of Liberty Council. Despite how much politicians try to use euphemisms to deny it, every human life begins at conception, and thousands of biologists now confirm this truth. It should go without saying that every unborn and born baby has value no matter the stage or the circumstances. Anyway, he cited a, a, a scientific study that said, uh, survey assessment, that 95%, and this was 5,212 out of 5,502 biologists who participated affirmed that by the biological view that life begins at fertilization or, or conception. Now let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. Human life begins at conception. The Bible shows that, that unlike human beings who don't know everything, God does know how babies grow into the womb. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so do you not know the works of God who makes everything. In Luke chapter 1, verses 41 to 44, we're not going to go there, Elizabeth makes positive comments about her unborn baby, John the Baptist, leaping. And there are statements that the angel gave to Mary to tell her about her upcoming conception also provides additional biblical support for the idea that the unborn are human. Uh, let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, I'm going to start in verse 13. Uh, to read something about David, or what David wrote. To God, David says, Psalm 139, verse 13, For you formed my inner parts, inward parts. You covered me, my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret... And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they are, were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So basically, David says, God, you, know, you formed me in the womb, you knew me from the beginning, and therefore I was real in the womb, I was a person in the womb. Why do I mention this? Well, because when the abortionists kept pushing it, back in the late 60s, early 70s, they would make things like, well, it's not really human, it's a piece of flesh, it's just a pile of tissue, it's, we don't really know when life begins, how can we know for sure? Well, the Bible makes it clear that no, God considered people human before they were born. Uh, let's also go to uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah no, chapter 1. Then the word, starting verse 5, Jeremiah writes, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So Jeremiah was ordained a prophet before he was born, while he was in his mother's womb, apparently, because uh, that would be before he was born. So obviously God considered the unborn baby to be a person or a human. You don't have to go there, but in Isaiah 44, verse uh, 24, says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 21. And 
if you go to Exodus 21, we're going to start reading in verse 22. And we'll see that even a death penalty could come from an injury to a pregnant woman. It says, If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so first of all, you see the woman is considered to be with child. What do you call a human, little human? You call him a child. Okay. So that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows. Surely he will be punished according to the woman's husband opposes on him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. The expression, no harm follows, can basically be interpreted that uh, the, the mother and the baby are fine and they're healthy. But if they're not, and they're somehow permanently harmed, punishment will follow, apparently, possibly including the death penalty, if either die. God does not condone the killing of unborn infants. In the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, a term is translated about 26 times as infant or child or little one is the Hebrew word, what we'll call O-W-L-E-L, -L -L. Same word is used for uh, unborn infants in Job uh, 3.16. God considers unborn infants to be living human beings. And human life, of course, you can't consider it to, to be existing prior to conception. Uh, one is that the Bible condemns uh, uh, sex outside of marriage, and no one's biblically required to get uh, married, so it's, it's not a sin to remain celibate. Uh, and the natural monthly menstrual cycle that women go through uh, results in a loss of an ovum each month. So the ovum is not something that the God says you have to keep alive. Of, and make sure you get fertilized every month. It's not that. In a male, uh, non-copulated sperm is reabsorbed. Uh, since God designed these events, it should be obvious that human life uh, doesn't consider prior to the joining of uh, the sperm and ovum together, because more uh, sperm and ova die naturally than possibly could be uh, get together for conception. Well, abortion kills a human life, but what about birth control? Well, that depends. Specifically, the Bible doesn't teach against birth control methods that don't involve killing unborn babies, partial birth abortions, or uh, stopping inheritance like uh, Onan did in uh, Genesis 38, uh, 8 to 10. But like a little bit of history about birth control, and this is from uh, Time. 1550 BC, an ancient Egyptian manuscript called Ebers Papyrus directs women on how to mix dates, acacia, and honey into a paste, smear it over wool, and use it as a pessary to prevent conception. A pessary is something that you insert vaginally, and basically it was basically a barrier device uh, to keep uh, well, the sperm from getting into uh, the, the cervix and therefore possibly getting up to the fallopian tubes in the ovum. Uh, let's see. It says not every there are other ways people tried. Not everything was effective. Uh, this is uh, coitus interruptus isn't particularly effective, and it said they had some other weird weird things that they they tried to do, and Persian people tried to jump backwards ten times and believe in magic numbers, yet researchers found some of the older methods actually uh, were effective and were not uh, lethal, particularly such as the one I mentioned about with the Egyptians. Uh, did. Uh, then other things were developed uh, in the 1700s. They came up with uh, uh, condoms and uh, from sheep and then uh, in the 1800s from, from rubber. Now I'd like to read something from the old uh, Worldwide Church of God. This is from a book from Herbert W. Armstrong called The Missing Dimension in Sex. Planned Parenthood they don't, he doesn't mean the organization. Violates no law of God. Planned Parenthood is a definite contribution to the supreme purpose of character building. It entails, of course, responsibility for the right and wise planning. Any teaching or legislation which violates the divine purpose of God, which instills in wives the dread and fear of pregnancies, of religious heresy, and in violation and or a violation of the higher laws of God Almighty. No wife should ever need to suffer for the fear of pregnancy. It's natural for every wife 
to want to become a mother, to prevent having children, producing a family would be a direct violation of God's commands. Be fruitful, excuse me, God's command of, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. But to plan a family in an intelligent manner as to the time of the first arrival and the time spacing of other children, that's a different matter. Nothing in the Bible forbids this. Much in the Bible, in principle, supports it. And we in the Continuing Church of God do believe that the Bible does allow for birth control. I'd like to read something the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Just one verse, which will be verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those in his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than infidel. Now the principle about providing for one's family implies that one will not have more children one can provide for, but not abortion. Now, it's possible, and I think in Matthew 24, why don't we go over there? I think Matthew 24, uh, Jesus was promoting uh, birth control. Uh, you may not see it that way, but let me go with this. This is Matthew 24, starting in verse 19. This is talking about the times of the end. The apostles asked what was going to happen, the, what's going to happen at the end before Jesus returns. He's going through various signs, and he says, But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your plight not be in the winter or in the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. I think Jesus is warning his followers that they may not wish to be pregnant just before the time of the great tribulation. And if so, uh, some type of birth control might be uh, advisable for married people when the wife is fertile and is getting closer to the time to flee. And, you know, Jesus talked about uh, fleeing in uh, Matthew 24 as well. But he also referred to some things going back to the book of Daniel. So it's been my position for quite some time, uh, for at least 10 years, that uh, when the uh, deal of uh, Daniel uh, 9, uh, 27 has been confirmed, that this is a time to tell people about this, and then as time goes on, you get closer to the time of the Great Tribulation, it might be a time to try to not to have babies because it uh, takes you know, about nine months, you add, add up all the time, and then you've got three, uh, three and a half years from the time that deal is confirmed to when we see the abomination desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in a holy place that Jesus also referred to in Matthew 24. And yes, I probably should have gone to Matthew 24 and read all those scriptures, but I've read them enough, hopefully most of you are familiar with them, that uh, you, since people will nurse babies up until up to two or even three sometimes. Sometime shortly after that deal has been confirmed, it might be wise to not uh, get pregnant. Because again, Jesus is warning, woe to those who are pregnant, nursing babies in those days. Now, there's a, while there's a lot of differences between uh, the Church of God, the true Church of God and the Orthodox Church, uh, I'd like to read something from the Orthodox Church on this particular subject. One of the reasons I want to do this is that some people are Roman Catholic and they believe they should not have any form of birth control. However, they also tend to consider that the Eastern Orthodox are Catholic. And by the way, the, their official term is Orthodox Catholic Church, but they call themselves. Anyway, here's something from the Eastern Orthodox. A view has taken hold among Orthodox writers and thinkers on this topic, which permits the use of certain contraceptive practices within marriage for the purpose of spacing children enhancing the expression of marital love and protecting health. Now, as far as birth control methods, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on there, but basically barrier methods of birth control are generally acceptable for Christians. Also, some timing methods that don't resolve, result in violating scriptural restrictions against intercourse during a woman's monthly menstrual period, uh, that would be fine. So. You can try that, although there's a, there's a joke about those who practice, what do you call the people who practice the rhythm method? And the joke is the answer is parents. <laughs> um, but uh, biblically, uh, you could try that. But again, uh, Bible in Leviticus uh, 20 verse uh, 18 and Ezekiel 22 10 says uh, uh, no sex during a, 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 when your wife is having a period. And the wife is not supposed to have sex with her husband at the same time, obviously. Uh, the other, another inappropriate method, uh, well, an inappropriate method for uh, birth control would be uh, sodomy, which the Bible uh, condemns in various places. I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but that's not an appropriate form of birth control. 
Now, other methods may or may not be appropriate, uh, and you, you need, people need to look into them to determine whether they are. But abortive devices and interuterine devices are not appropriate for children. Uh, some forms of birth control pills uh, also are abortive, and I would say you need to look into those. And we don't have we do not have a position. We don't have a, an analysis of each of the potential things out there. So uh, don't this, I'm not I'm saying don't write us and ask for which what type of birth control pill might be okay. We don't know. And I don't intend to really look in it. You need to look into yourself. But again, if if the form of birth control kills or is expected to uh, dislodge and kill a fertilized ovum, uh, that would be uh, considered abortive, and we wouldn't consider that appropriate because you're killing a baby. Abortion has been done throughout history, but they've been uh, never been as common as they are now. There's been some estimates that uh, about one out of four pregnancies uh, end in abortion each year. And this is based on some global estimates from the World Health Organization. Uh, we've seen something similar uh, in the United States. And more people have been uh, killed by abortions than almost anything else, it seems like, in the, in the last uh, century or so. Because uh, there's one estimate there's been a, in the 20th and 21st century that a billion lives have been aborted. In the United States, there's been over 60 million abortions since 1973. And here's something it says, at 2014 abortion rates, about one in four women will have an abortion by age 45. Well, the rate seems to be dropping a little bit, so maybe it's closer to one out of five in the United States. But here's something I want to comment about abortion that people might be surprised to find out. White patients account for 39% of abortion procedures in 2014, black patients for 28%, Hispanic patients for 25%, and patients of other races and ethnicities, 9%. So we see a disproportionate amount of blacks who are aborted, and that's been the case for quite some time. One uh, black entertainer was was basically calling it uh, genocide against uh, against blacks, but it shouldn't be done. Of course, it shouldn't be done for blacks or Hispanics or whites or any other ethnic, Asians or any other ethnic group they may have missed. The Bible prophesied in the last days people will be without natural affection. Uh, that's Second uh, Timothy three three in the King James. And this term means, uh, it comes from uh, the term estorgos, and it's supposed to mean hard-hearted toward kindred or without natural affection. Basically, it shows lack of love toward those you're related to. That's what this basically means. And that's certainly true as far as abortion, abortions go. Now, one other thing that's happened around the world is that in various societies, they've tended to abort girls more than boys, and uh, this this causes a this causes a variety of problems. One of the reasons they do this is that in general, it's uh, less expensive to raise males, and in general, uh, throughout pretty much almost the entire world, males tend to uh, end up having a higher income potential. Uh, definitely on average than, than females. And there's other reasons, but those are a couple of them. But this uh, gender, gender aside, which is sometimes called intense increased violence, let me read something here. There is indeed compelling evidence of a link between sex ratio and violence. In Chinese provinces where the sex ratio has spiked, that means there's more males and females a lot, a crime wave has followed. Today in India, the predictor of violence and crime for any given region is not the income. A lot of times people say, oh, poor people are more involved with, uh, with crime. He says it's not the income, but the sex ratio. So in other places, in other words, where there's a disproportionate amount of males to females, there's more, there's more crime. I also think that abortions, when China had its one-child policy, will be one of the reasons why it will be easy to easier for the 200 million man army of Revelation 19 to be put together. Now, when we talk about abortion, particularly in the Western world, and for example, in the United States during the presidential debates, uh, it, they don't like to 
call it that. They like to call it choice and various other things, and they try to say the woman has certain uh, rights. And women do have certain rights, but there are certain rights that they don't have, and there are certain rights that men don't have. And uh, let's go to... Uh, well, basically... Um, let's go to... I, I, I'm going to read this. I was debating. Deuteronomy 22. Starting in verse 13, if a man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman, when I came to her I found she wasn't a virgin, then the father and mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. The young woman's father say to the elders, I give my daughter to this man his wife, he detests her, now he's charged us with shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin, and yet these are the evidence of our daughter's virginity. They shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders take up the man, man and punish him. They shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the one, young woman, because he's brought a bad name upon the virgin Israel. He shall, she shall be his wife. She cannot divorce her all the day. So this basically gives a woman the right to not have her reputation properly tarnished. Uh, women have the right not to be raped. If you continue down chapter 2, 22 down to verse 25 and 26. If a woman finds a man, if, excuse me, if a man finds a betrothed woman, young woman in the countryside, a man forces her to lie with her, the only man who lies with her shall die. You should do nothing, young woman. There's nothing, young woman, no sin deserving of death. This is like when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, even so does this matter. And another right that women, like men, have is the right not to marry. They have the right to marry or to not marry. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Of course, the Bible says uh, the only time you're, allowed, you're supposed to be able to have, you're allowed to have sex biblically is a, a man and a wife who, woman, man and woman who are married to each other. That's, that's it. So women who are not married shouldn't be getting pregnant. <laughs> okay. As far as uh, 1 Corinthians goes, Paul writes, But to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them to remain as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, it's better to marry than burn with passion. Also, women have the right to decide who they're going to marry if they want to marry. Going to Genesis chapter 24. And I'm talking about women's rights because they try to say abortion, talk about women's rights, but they don't seem to recognize what rights and obligations both men and women have. Genesis uh, 24, verse 58. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So she was asked if she was going to be willing to, to get married. And she said, uh, uh, yes, she'd marry uh, Isaac. And then we go down to verse 67. Then Isaac brought her into Mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. You don't have to go there, but Numbers 36, 6. So this is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of uh, Zelophehad, saying, let them marry who they think best. As far as who is it best to marry, well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be their people. Therefore, come up from among them, be separate, and don't touch what's unclean, I'll receive you, and I'll be a father to you, and I'll, you shall be my sons and daughters. Well, as Christians, we're supposed to be the temple of the living God, as this says, and we're not supposed to, uh, our bodies are supposed to be, we're the temple of God. And we're not supposed to be joining our bodies with someone who's an unbeliever. Uh, so you are not to marry someone who's not in the church of God. Now, we don't restrict people to marry only within the continuing church of God. Um, we hope that people who are in the continuing church of God who marry, that their spouse will be interested in the continuing church of God. But we recognize that uh, particularly uh, in many places, we just don't have a lot of people 
And there are people in other churches of God, some of which hopefully will be interested enough and perhaps be willing to, to marry, would marry people. But the position of the continuing church of God, by the way, is we will not, no one, in, well, let me write a word another way. None of the ministry or representatives of the continuing church of God are authorized or allowed to by the continuing church of God to marry a believer to an unbeliever. Uh, the only exception to that has to do with uh, pregnancy, but beyond that, there is we don't allow it, we don't do it. Um, and interestingly, I got a phone call uh, about a week or so ago from someone who's not with us. He's with another Church of God group. Why he called me, I'm not totally sure. I think he called me because he asked two Church of God groups that he attends with an answer to a question, and they didn't give him the answer. So he calls me, and he asked uh, if he could marry a Gentile. And, and I didn't. Necess- I don't know if the guy was a Gentile or, or not, but presumably he thought he was an Isra- Israelite or something. And I said, we, you know, we don't have a restriction about marrying a Gentile. As a matter of fact, we have information about marriage and that type of thing and dating in this particular book on dating. But I found out that's not what he meant when he said Gentile. I thought he, he was talking about a person from a particular country who would have a darker skin than he had. And but that wasn't the question. The question he was really asking was, is it, was it okay for him to marry somebody who was not in the Church of God? Because I asked him, I said, is this woman, I said, if she's uh, uh, baptized in uh, the Church of God, yeah, that's if you, probably, you could marry her. And then he's like, oh, no, she's not baptized. It's just hard to find somebody in the Church of God. <laughs> and uh, so we discussed this for some time, and I explained that, uh, no, we would not consider that to be appropriate. Um, as far as other things go, um, I'm not going to read this, but in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 3 through 5, talks about married couples are uh, to provide uh, sex to one another, so if you don't want to be involved with sex, don't get married. On the other hand, uh, uh, in Colossians 3.19, as far as some, some women's other rights, one, well, ones have sex with their husbands and vice versa. The other one is husbands love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. And we also see that repeated in Ephesians uh, 5, 25 to 28. And I'm going to read this because these are the biblical rights women have. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing by, of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Therefore, so husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, as he who loves his wife loves himself. Now let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Since uh, abortion is the main portion or topic of this particular sermon, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 15. The Bible tells both men and women which way to choose when they're faced with choices. Deuteronomy 30, starting verse 15. See, I set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God and walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God will bless you. So having children was something that God intended as a blessing for people. Now, going down to verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So, we're supposed to have our descendants live. We're not supposed to abort them or kill them. Um, We are supposed to choose life. Let's go to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, when we see what I... It looks to be the first reference to any type of abortion, a partial birth abortion. And so, starting in uh, Exodus 1, verse 15, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew, Hebrew midwives. Now, midwives are ladies that are with a woman who's having a baby, and they help her get through the process and help her with the baby. 
of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, so you see the baby starting to come out, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do so as the king of Egypt commanded him, but saved the male children alive. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. So they were threatened by the Pharaoh, told you've got to perform partial birth abortions or after birth abortions, infanticide. But they didn't do it. But there's something that I saw uh, in November 2019, it says a federal judge in New York struck down a new Trump administration rule that will allow health care clinicians to refuse to provide abortions for moral and religious reasons. Judge Paul A. Engelmeyer rejected federal rule in a Manhattan federal court after women's groups, health organizations, and multiple states sued the Department of Health and Human Services, arguing that the exemption is unconstitutional. Now then we're going to read something from New York Attorney General Letitia James, who led the lawsuit for the states. The refusal of care rule was an unlawful attempt to allow health care providers to openly discriminate and refuse to provide necessary health care for patients based on providers' religious beliefs or moral objections. We will continue to use every tool at our disposal to protect access to health care and protect the rights of all individuals. Well, abortion is not health care, it's murder. And unconstitutional? The U.S. is clearly not being supportive of freedom of religion, which is specifically mentioned in this Constitution, whereas medical care certainly isn't. Actually, the bio, you know, United States, we're supposed to have the life, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and you kill a baby who's not been born, the baby doesn't have that right. So as far as the U.S. Constitution's founding documents go, they're against it by saying you can't have that particular religious right. I think this is absolutely atrocious. Now, even pagan cultures in the past have realized that abortion is, is wrong. In 1 Timothy 4.1, the Bible warns about doctrines of demons in the latter times. And surely abortion is not a doctrine of good angels. And uh, there's an expert from the United, so-called experts in the United Nations, he's been advocating killing unborn children who have Down syndrome. And uh, one woman responded back, you don't speak for us. If you tell a woman your child has, has Downs, what's it called Down syndrome? I can tell you that, or he may have a handicap for the rest of his life. It should be possible to resort to abortion to avoid the handicap, he said. This is what this guy said. And but the, the woman said, I'm a human being just like you. The only difference is an extra chromosome. The extra chromosome makes me far more tolerant than you. And so she was a woman with Down syndrome was complaining they want to kill them, kill them all off. Now, I would comment that in general, children with people with Down syndrome seem to be more innocent than most other people. And I'd like to explain why I said that. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read Exodus 23.6, which says, Do not kill the innocent. And Deuteronomy 21, verse 9 says, So you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do what's right in the sight of the Lord. Now, of course, it's not just Down's babies who haven't been born who are innocent at all. Babies are innocent before they're born. Psalm 106. You might want to go there. I'm going to read a couple of verses there. Read something that God condemns. Psalm 106, starting verse 37. So, excuse me, they even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. That's what I've mentioned before about abortion being a doctrine of demons. 
Verse 38, and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. If you want to go to Proverbs 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 16 a few verses. Proverbs uh, 6, starting verse 16. These things the Lord of Yahweh hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. This is what the organization Planned Parenthood does, in my opinion. Feet that are swift to, in running to evil. A false witness who spreads lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. And I think all of these apply to the abortion industry. They've been misleading. They're trying to do things that are evil. They shed innocent blood. They want to. They keep trying to make sure they can continue to do that. Now I'd like to go to Isaiah 59, starting verse 7. Isaiah 59, starting verse 7 says, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts, thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. Certainly that's what abortionists are doing. The way of peace they have not known, and there's no justice in their ways. They've made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Now I want to go to Jeremiah. No, I'm, yeah, yeah, Jeremiah 22. I'd like to read verse 3. Thus says the Lord, or eternal, Yahweh, Execute judgment and righteousness, and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Now, if you're in Jeremiah 22, we're going to go down to verse 17. So, Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. You know, when you read through various reasons for abortions, part of it has to do with uh, covetousness. Not all, but some of it does. And you don't have to go there, but 2 Kings 24.4, it talks about a leader who fills his land with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Because of that, God had the king of Babylon uh, and others uh, to destroy over there. And the Bible also talks about a time when the end time Babylon is going to destroy the United States. You don't have to go there, but Psalm 119 verse 172 says, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. As far as the, righteous, as far as the commandments go, we have a book called the Ten Commandments uh, that you might find helpful. It's available at the www.ccog.org website. Go under the literature tab under books and booklets and you can find this. In Proverbs 14, verse 4, for, excuse me, Proverbs 14, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sins are reproached to any people. Killing babies through abortion is not righteous. It's a reproach among the nations that uh, encourage it. Those who consent to abortion are often proud, and they think that they try to make it sound like they're not doing anything wrong. But women who are involved in abortions, who have them done, they're struck emotionally for the rest of their life. You know, even the woman that the pro-abortion forces use in the United States to get the Roe versus Wade pro-abortion decision, her name was uh, Norma uh, McCorvey. She was the one called the alias uh, Jane Roe. On January 22nd, uh, 1973, she, she later her, regretted her decision so much so that in August of 1995, she announced she'd become an advocate for Operation Rescue's campaign to make abortion illegal. So she was used by the abortion industry. They didn't really care about her. They just wanted to do this. And there's a lot of ways the uh, pro-abortion people don't want people to know the truth about abortion. Let me read something. Uh, three major U.S. newspapers are being criticized for rejecting a paid ad submitted by a national pro-life group. The Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and the USA Today all refused to run a sensitive and compelling ad created by a national pro-life group, Heroic Media, which shows a hand 
holding a tiny 24-year-old pre-born baby, includes the tagline, this child has no voice, which is why it depends on yours. Speak up. And they don't want those type of ads ran because some people might be able to make a more informed choice, realizing that it's a baby they're about to kill. And we continue to see various things associated with the abortion industry. Suppression of truth is one. Uh, there was an article that I saw a while back called 15 Deadly Lies of Abortion uh, Pushers. So I'd like to read some of this. Lie number one, when life begins. The answer is, science is very clear. All the chromosomes are present at the moment of conception. So we know that's when human life begins. So to say it's not, that's not it. Lie number two is, the unborn aren't humans until they take their first breath. And actually, science informs us that the uh, unborn child breathes in utero uh, through the umbilical cord. So that's the case. And actually, after baby's born, he still holds his breath, or she holds her breath all the time. Anyway, line number three, the woman determines the child's value. The fallacy goes like this. Any unborn child is worthless unless the mother ascribes some value to him or her. If she prefers to go to finish a college course before giving birth, then the baby becomes less valuable and as expendable. And so line number four, abortions are safe. There are physical and psychological consequences, some very severe. Line five, infanticide is more humane than growing up in a poor and unwanted. Uh, well, the Bible doesn't say you can kill somebody because you think they're better off uh, dead. And a lot of times, uh, if people don't want to have a child, uh, they could give the child up for adoption. There seems to be a big, there's still basically a waiting list for uh, infants in this country. And line number six, the unborn feel no pain or dismemberment uh, up to five months. And that's not true. I've looked into various things, what happens to the uh, unborn children. If you look at how, what happens with abortion, yes, they do feel pain. And whether, even if they didn't, you're still killing them. It's still not appropriate. In France, uh, they've also been trying to stop people from telling the truth about abortion. And let me read uh, this article. This is from Christianity Today. People who try to discourage women from having an abortion are now virtually considered criminals in France. By a show of hands, French lawmakers voted to pass a law sanctioning websites that aim to dissuade women from terminating a pregnancy by using misleading claims on abortion. By misleading, they mean websites which emphasize the negative psychological and physical impacts that abortions can have on women, according to National Right to Life. Violators of this law face a punishment of uh, two years or a fine in jail or a fine of up to 30,000 euros, according to Catholic Herald. France has already imposed a ban on pro-lifers demonstrating outside of abortion clinics. They've tried to do that in the United States, too, but generally speaking, uh, that's still to some degree allowed, but they do have restrictions. Anyway, I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Isaiah 5, verse 20. What are those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? What the pro-abortion people basically try to say is they're just being kind to the women and they're, it's evil to not allow them to do this. It's bad if they have their babies, etc., etc. And it's a woman's right. Uh, and to, to block it is evil. And this is what the Bible says. What are those who call evil good and good evil? Women do not have to get married if they do not wish to. Uh, therefore, they don't have to. Therefore, they don't have to have sex. Therefore, they won't. They won't get pregnant. Uh, being raped is a different situation. But even then, a child can be given up for abortion. I shouldn't for adoption. I shouldn't say abortion. I obviously slip of the tongue. But and if women do get married, they understand that uh, uh, proper birth control is allowed, particularly uh, barrier types. But that, uh, according to the Bible, they are expected if they're married to to engage in, in sex as well as uh, to have children. Now I want to read something in the New Testament, Romans one verse eighteen. You don't have to go there, but I'll just read it. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Well, abortion is wrong and abortion is murder. And it's wrong to try to stop people from telling people the truth about abortion. France and other places have been going the wrong way on this. Because of speech, laws, and actions, a time come uh, when more of the following is fulfilled. This is from Amos 5, verse 13. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it's an evil time. Yet, in Isaiah 58, verse 1, we in the continuing church of God are striving to fulfill this, which says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. And abortion is a sin. Now, we've made various uh, videos about uh, abortion. Uh, we've made at least three. One was called Abortion the Bible and U.S. Debt. One's called The Land of Free Abortions and Debt. And one has to do with uh, infanticide. Now, these are shorter videos, uh, sermonette type videos. So we've been doing this for quite some time. We know the time is going to come when there'll be a salmon of the word. You know, Jesus warned in John 9, 4, the time's coming when no one can work because they're not going to, to allow that. And Herbert Armstrong uh, in from the old Worldwide Church of God in, in October 23rd, 1980, co-worker letter wrote, the Bible warns us the time just ahead when no one can work and the Lord's work. We must sacrifice now as never before for this work, that we may finish the work Christ has given us to do. Pray as never before for the work. And of course, we get a lot closer to the time when he wrote that. And again, we are lifting our voice like a trumpet and talking about what people need to hear. Because the time is going to come, I'll go to Amos 8, verse 11. The time is going to come when we see more and more restrictions on things that are not considered politically correct. Uh, not only in places like uh, the United States and France, but basically throughout all of Europe. Uh, verse 11, Behold the days of... This is from Amos 8, verse 11. Behold the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or first thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, the water from sea to sea, from north to east, and they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but won't find it. So government pressure will eventually uh, make, make, that, make that the case. Now, one thing that's uh, been going on with abortion, and this I've talked about in some of the uh, videos, is abortion, uh, U.S. debt, and relative living standards. In uh, 2018, Chelsea Clinton uh, made some comments. Whether you fundamentally care about reproductive rights and ac access rights, because they're not the same thing. If you care about social justice or economic justice, you have to care about this. It is not a disconnected fact to address the T-shirt of 1973 that American women entering the labor force from 1973 to 2009 added $3.5 trillion to our economy, right? The net new interest of women. That's not disconnected from the fact that Roe versus Wade became the law of the land in January of 1973. So she's saying that because of Roe versus Wade, the killing of babies, that uh, the United States had greater economic growth, and so this was a good thing. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel 22, starting verse 13. God says, Behold, therefore I beat my fist at the dishonest profit you have made, and the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure? where your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you. The Lord has spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, and remove your filthiness from you. Well, any economic so-called benefit from abortion is uh, at best a dishonest profit from bloodshed. It's not going to end well for the United States. And interestingly, I found something from CBS a couple of years ago, in 2017. It says, Reagan might have... Clinch the, the 1980 election when he asked, are you better off than you were four years ago? Today the question is, are you better off than your parents 50 years ago? The study from the National Bureau of Economic Research has the answer, at least in terms of paycheck, is no. Most Americans are worse off and become even more worse off if possible. In particular, men have endured stagnation in lifetime incomes. 
And if you take inflation into account in real dollars, males lost close to 300,000 lifetime earnings compared to the generation that came age in the 1950s and 1960s boom years. So they said for 50 years, if you go back 50 years from 2017, that brings you to 1967. Well, what started to happen then? Well, that's when the abortion industry started to rise up. I read an article on, from the history of abortion from the National Abortion Federation. Between 1967 and 1973, one third of the states liberalized or repealed abor criminal abortion laws. So as they started to liberalize or eliminate laws against abortion, the situa economic situation in the United States began to change. Here's something else. From that, until 1970, the United States had a trade surplus and a favorable balance of trade. But after that, the United States started to borrow, buy more goods than it sold. And we went from a surplus to a trade deficit. And also after 1970, the United States became a, a debtor nation. And it depends on when you count it to when it became a debtor nation. The United States has been living off of debt ever since then. And the time is going to come when, eventually, uh, this debt's going to have to be paid and I find it interesting that the, all this coincided with the liberalization of abortion laws. Now I realize there's a statement in statistics that says uh, correlation is not causation. And I'm not saying it was just liberalizing abortion laws that turned the United States into a debt, a net debtor nation and uh, running trade deficits and all that kind of stuff. But the attitude, which was to move further away from the Bible, uh, which warns against debt, by the way, um, and some other things are going on uh, with morality, I think, are, are factors. So, I read Romans 118, and I want to go back there. Romans 118. For the wrath of God is unveiled from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now going back to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, their whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, blast boasters, inventors of evil things, and many forms of abortions are evil things that were invented, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only those who do the same, but those who approve of those who practice them. And a lot of those terms apply to the abortion situation, plus the attitude that started to hit more and more in the United States, where they were promoting evil. Now, here's something else. After 1973, I'm reading this from an article called Economic Growth in the Internet Age. After 1973, wages, for example, just for inflation, went nowhere. The typical working stiff earns less as real money than he did before. And so, is this, is this a coincidence with abortion? Maybe, maybe not. But we also saw that we had the, the debt that, uh, that was accumulated this, at that time. And in Habakkuk 2, it talks about the covetous and getting debt, and at some point in time that they're going to pay for this. Now, what's interesting is medical doctors used to take something called the Hippocratic Oath. And the old Hippocratic Oath was against abortion. You weren't uh, allowed to do that. As a matter of fact, let me read something from it. This was from Wikipedia. I don't know if it's still there. It was there in December 2013. I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment and never do harm to anyone. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. Okay, so there were sometimes with these pessaries I talked about before, there were some toxic uh, chemicals you could put in there that would kill a baby. And she wouldn't do that. And that was part of the Hippocratic Oath. And uh, so they don't do that anymore. And they, they certainly, they certainly violate, violate this. Now some have 
claim that uh, we need aborted babies to do stem cell research. Uh, and sadly, uh, there's been some reports of vaccine tissue made with aborted babies. And as a scientist, let me simply say that there are other ways to deal with this other than with uh, aborted babies. Uh, for example, uh, various tissues from animals, uh, particularly very young animals, could be used for some of this research. And there's other ways they could do this. They didn't need abortion for this, but one of the reasons I believe they have had promoted abortions has, in, with the stem cell research is to try to make it seem like abortions are good and that people need them and they try to get people. Um, we have had uh, some, some controversy in the United States about uh, this group called Planned Parenthood selling uh, uh, baby parts. And if you go to Revelation chapter 18, now Planned Parenthood likes to deny that they were selling baby parts. They say they're only getting it at cost or something, but when I listened to all the details, it sounded like they were trying to make profits from it. Anyway, look, look at Bab uh, Revelation 18 verse 10 talks about Babylon. Then down to verse 11 talks about the merchants of the earth. Uh, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and linens and purple and scarlet and every kind of wood, every kind of ivory, every kind of object, most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots. Well, it sounds like, you know, normal trade, but notice what else is part of the normal trade. And the bodies and souls of men. There's also prophecy in Ezekiel 27, 13 to 14 that Javan, Tubal, Meshach were your traders. They bartered human lives and vessels for a bronze for your merchandise. So we see that if you go into Revelation 17, excuse me, 18, verse 4, it talks about Christians aren't supposed to have anything to do with Babylon. They're going to be buying and selling humans. Sometimes maybe just their body parts, sometimes the whole people for slavery. As far as uh, Planned Parenthood goes, uh, its uh, founder had racist views. Its founder was uh, uh, Margaret Sanger, and she had some supporters. She wasn't the only one involved, but she said uh, that blacks, immigrants, and indigents were human weeds, reckless bleeders, breeders, spawning uh, human beings who never should have been born. And she believed in sterilization and racial purification. And Here's something else she said. We do not want the word to get out. We want to exterminate the Negro population. If it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Okay. So as it turns out, uh, black Americans tend to get uh, more abortions than, than others. Well, one of the reasons that... Uh, People claim they need to have a, uh, uh, abortions is because of uh, unplanned or unwanted pregnancies. Well, you're only supposed to have sex when you're married, and so you should to be able to plan it. And if you have a baby, you need to bring it to, to term. Now, the Bible warns that we need to flee uh, sexual immorality, and we're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves. And when you, take, you have an unborn baby, you don't want to kill it because that's certainly not uh, loving it. And I'd like to uh, read something from a document called the Didache. This is a probably early first century, some uh, or excuse me, late first century, early second century. You shall not murder. You shall not be sexually promiscuous. You shall not abort a child or commit infanticide. And let me read something that Tertullian wrote. This is a late, uh, late second century, early third century. Christians who were endued with the same principle of humanity with other men, that they went so far from being friends to murder and manslaughter, they held it unlawful to be present in gladiator sports where men's lives were so wantonly sacrificed for pleasure and curiosity of people. And if they accounted it murder for any woman by evil arts to procure abortion, to stifle an embryo, to kill a child in a manner before it's alive. But in regards to child murder, it doesn't matter if it was committed for a sacred 
object or merely one's own self-impulse. So Tertullian is saying that uh, sometimes they might say they're dedicating it to the gods or whatever. He says it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Now, as it turns out, one difference between the, the Church of God and the Church of Rome is that in the Church of Rome, sometimes they have permitted abortions. And I'm going to read something from the Catholic Saint Hippolytus. He's writing about another Catholic saint called Callistus. I think he, he they made Callistus a saint. Um, he wrote, Callistus, for he even permitted females, if they were unwedded and burned with passion at the age of becoming, uh, and they weren't necessarily married, to have whoever they want as a bedfellow, whether slave or free, that the woman, not legally married, could might consider a companion a husband. Whence women, reputed believers, began to resort to drugs for producing sterility and agird themselves round, so to expel what was conceived on account from not having wished to have a child, either by a slave or by a paltry fellow, for the sake of their family and excessive wealth. Behold, into how great impiety the lawless one has proceeded by inculcating adultery and murder at the same time. So basically what Hippolytus was saying was there are women who had money, and the Catholic bishop Callista said it was okay for them to commit adultery and to get, kill their babies. Uh, and the Catholic Encyclopedia specifically says, Callistus allowed the lower clergy to marry and permitted noble ladies to marry low persons and slaves, which by woman law was forbidden. He thus had given occasion for infanticide. Now the Catholic Church has claimed that some of the first century, uh, the Church has affirmed every moral evil of every procured abortion. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortion, that is to say, abortion willed either as an end to the mean or is gravely contrary to moral law. Now that's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So their claims from the first century they didn't allow abortion, but that's not true because Callistus did, and they consider them one of their people. And others have made the same, same claims. However, if you go through this, you'll find that people like uh, uh, Augustine and others didn't think it was necessarily wrong. And then Gregory the Sixth from 1045 to 46 said, He is not a murderer who brings about abortion before the souls in the body. And Gregory the Eighth, 1572 to 1585, said it was not homicide to kill an embryo less than 40 days since it wasn't yet human. However, his successor, Sixtus V, disagreed and made all abortions for any reason homicide and cause for excommunication. However, his successor, Gregory XIV, reversed this decree. And in 1621, the Vatican issued another pastoral directive permitting abortion for up to 40 days. And of course, in the continuing Church of God, we don't believe in abortion. We don't believe any of our early leaders supported abortion. And we don't believe that that should have been uh, uh, acceptable. And I'd like to read something that an uh, anti-abortion person posted. And it was, abortion shows lack of faith. And I would agree. And I agree that uh, any Roman Catholic bishops who or, or pontiffs who allowed abortion, that was wrong. And in the uh, uh, Church of God, I know of no leader, any true Church of God leader who ever uh, recommended an abortion. Okay, so something we don't do. But anyway, this one article says, uh, Romans 14.23 says, For whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith it's possible, impossible to please God. And this author, in my opinion correctly, says, To have an abortion is to take matters into your own hands, rather than to trust God to work things out. This shows a lack of faith in God, which the Bible labels as sin. A desperate woman says, I can't afford to have a child. I'm not ready for this. Lady, you need to start trusting God and claiming His promises. You need to stop trying to run your own life for a change and start trusting God. You don't need an abortion, for such will only increase your troubles. The devil has you thinking that abortion is the answer. They'll take care of everything. And you're very close to giving in to his subtle temptation. If you do, you'll regret it forever, and God will hold you accountable. And I agree with that. Abortion pretty well shows a lack of understanding about humanity. You know, abortion is wrong. It's not something that anyone should do. 
Let me read something from uh, The Mystery of the Ages by the late uh, Church of God Pastor General Herbert W. Armstrong. At this point, let me inject a truth at the time this, this is being written. It's probably the most controversial question issued in the Western world population, the question of abortion. The human spirit enters the human embryo at conception. It is this, this spirit that may, upon the adult conversion, be united with the Holy Spirit from the great creator God, impregnating that human with God life as a child of living God. In a state of gestation, though yet is unborn, to destroy an embryo or fetus in a mother's room is murder, to a potential future God being. And we, of course, would agree with agree with that. As a matter of fact, to learn more about God's plan, we have a book called The Mystery of God's Plan that uh, may help you with that. But the other thing I should comment, if you've, if you've had an abortion, don't think that your child is, is, is lost and God could not have a plan for you. We also have another book called Universal Offer for Salvation, which is also available at the ccog.org website as is this book and uh, the Ten Commandments book that I held up before. Anyway, if you have had an abortion, you can be forgiven. The Bible says that Jesus is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, anyway, life clearly begins at conception. Conception is the start, uh, start of life. Abortion is murder. It's a disgusting practice. While some leaders associated with the Church of Rome have supported it, uh, none of the true Church of God ever have. We're opposed to it. Abortion is the uh, killing of an innocent life, shedding of innocent blood. The Bible says women have the right not to, and obligations as men too, to not be involved in uh, uh, fornication or rape. Uh, and women have the right to not get married. The Bible does allow for birth control that does not induce abortion. But as far as the United States goes, the United States has been going more and more in debt and having other problems since it legalized abortion. Abortion is not good. Abortion is murder. And don't think that the United States and others are going to get away with abortion because it's not something that God believes in or condones. Do not be involved in abortion. Pray for those who are involved in the field that perhaps they will uh, repent even if laws of the United States don't want them to. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.